Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Arthritis Action Podcast. I'm Mark, your host, and today for this episode, I'm joined by Catherine Dyer. Catherine's a lead nurse at Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital Pain Management Service. Hello, Catherine. Hello, nice to meet you, Mark. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. That's no problem. Cool. So today we're going to talk about pain and explore you know, what you can do about it. So, I mean, um, I mean, pain probably needs very little introduction to people listening to this podcast. And uh, we did an episode about it in the last series as well with my colleague, David, who's an osteopath. So I thought it'd be quite good to approach the subject from a different set of expertise. So I'm going to be relying very heavily on you to keep this one running, Catherine. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, of course. Excellent. But so I thought um, we could start off with um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with arthritis. Yeah, it's lovely. Uh, so thank you again for your time, Mark. Um, I have been working as a specialist pain nurse in uh, the Norfolk and Norwich uh, Hospital Pain Management Service for uh, more than 20 years. I uh, enjoy every aspect of managing pain. So we we cover a acute pain service that looks after patients when they've had operations and are inpatient within the hospital setting. And we have an outpatient service, which is um, much more where we come across our patients with uh, pains from arthritis. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary pain management service. So I have the um, absolute delight of working alongside physiotherapists, psychologists, occupational therapists, and pain consultants who all have the sole and one aim of trying to help patients manage their pain differently. We see all sorts of different types of pain um, from different conditions, different illnesses, arthritis being one of those. Um, the majority of our patients have some sort of musculoskeletal pain, um, but others will have uh, pain relating to nerve damage or neurological conditions. And we very much work on a basis of pain management being something that um a condition that is managed rather than cured yes um and uh um, and we very much rely on the interplay between the professions to try and help patients from a self-management perspective i guess we guess we could kind of jump in from there so i mean so why do people experience pain well, I think that's a really difficult question. It's always yeah, good to sorry. start with a difficult question. Um, what we know about pain is that pain is one of our protective systems. In the early days of suffering with pain, we know that it's designed to keep us safe and well. We know that if we damage ourselves, um, we rely on pain to tell us that we might be doing some sort of um, damage or um, disruption to um, our bodies and our bodies then try and avoid avoid that to avoid further harm. So the easy example for that is if I put my hand on uh, the hot iron when I'm ironing my clothes in the morning, if I put my hand on the iron, I get information that goes through um, the through the body from my hand all the way through my body up into uh, the central part of the central nervous system and my brain will use its experiencing at that time, but also um, information from previous experience of what happened last time I put my hand on the iron, for example. Mm -hmm. And it will then help me and my body to protect us and initiate actions that mean that I pull my hand away from that iron and stop any further tissue damage. But of course, we know that for many people that live with persistent pain and some of those patients with arthritis, we know that long after those initial triggers have gone, that our bodies continue to experience long-term persistent pain. And that that's our brain struggling to work out what all of those signals are. It's thought to be around the interruption in the nervous system and the, the nerve cells that are triggered despite there being no new damage. But um, it is very true to say that persistent pain is a very common occurrence in the population. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, obviously, at this charity, we speak to a lot of people who live with persistent pain, you know, constantly. So that's one thing, I guess, like, you know, it does get asked a lot. I mean, the sort of analogy you used of like the putting your hand on an iron makes total sense. Like that's your body warning you stop doing that. You're hurting yourself. But I mean, why Why when something like arthritis, like if someone's got it in their knees, is it just continuing to tell them nonstop that they're in, you know, there's damage and they're in pain? 
And I think that's because our body, our, our body starts to learn about pain and it remembers those experiences from previously. Um, there's a very good uh, YouTube clip by Laura Mosley called Tame the Beast, which talks about why, why, why does my body remember? But it is around things that um, our body almost preempt in eventually the painful situation. So, for example, if I... Um, if I develop pain on walking, then every time my body thinks, oh, I'm going to go for a walk, then actually my body then starts to think, oh, last time I had pain and I went on a walk, my pain got worse. And then we also know that the psychological aspects of pain start to amplify that. And our bodies are on this hyper alert, like a volume switch of preemptive increase in volume, if you like. And, and that volume switch, I think, is quite interesting because not only does it, it do that when we're starting to think about those activities, but the more we carry on, the louder the volume switch. So the, the harder and harder the nervous system works in order to remind us that the time we we walked last time we got lots of pain mm. so that's really interesting because one, one that leads me to then start to thinking about like one bit of advice that so we've we so we champion quite a lot is that if you were to say strengthen the muscles surrounding a joint by like doing something more like walking or if it was in your knees then that can then sort of decrease the pain that is associated with the, those joints. So if it does remembering it's louder every time you do it, how does that then correlate with actually then kind of like, you know, doing it to make it easier in future? Cause it seems like it contradicts itself in a way. Exactly. And I think that's the really difficult thing, isn't it? So there is the element of our nervous system preempts the, the, the signals and therefore we um we worry about more more activity but actually also thinking about that deconditioning of muscles and muscle fibers and ligaments tendons also causes pain in its own right and we also know that if you can develop the if you can develop the muscles and ligaments for example around the knee joint that puts less pressure on the um arthritic joint itself um and we're very good before we develop persistent pain at forgetting that our our skeletal structure is not just the bones and the joints it is actually the the ligaments the tendons the muscles and if we were to pay more attention to using those muscles ligaments and tendons as they were designed then we probably would see less in the way of persistent pain problems um so i think there is a there is a balance there between making sure that deconditioning doesn't happen so if you become deconditioned if you remember if you have flu for a week and you end up in bed when you first get out of bed your legs are weak your muscles feel very sore and your mobility is often decreased and that happens very quickly so if with patients with persistent pain, as time's gone on, they're very often very more, very much more disabled by the multiple aspects of, of persistent pain. So it really sort of does emphasize just how important movement is when it comes to pain. I guess the, the, the old advice that is hard to believe ever existed of just bed rest and doing nothing is uh, obviously, as we know now, not the way to go. No, absolutely. But I think there's also the balance to be had mm. between that and overactivity or yes. overexercise. And I think that's sometimes forgotten in that um, the, the very positive person who manages with persistent pain will try very hard to push through it to carry on regardless phrases like make hay while the sun shines yes um and we also know that overactivity can in exactly the same way way it over excite and over inflame and turn up that volume of that nervous system so the really big balance is trying to find that ability between enough activity to prevent deconditioning and not so much activity that the nervous system goes into complete meltdown. Yeah, if, if only there was a, a sort of a set answer of like do this much work or something, it, it, it'll be different for every person. So it's really down to them, to whoever's got arthritis and whoever's going through this to 
basically trial and error, find out what works for you. And you can find that sweet spot in the middle where you're moving enough to progress, but not so much that you regress. Exactly. Are there any other types of pains? We've covered, let's say, persistent pain and also... Uh, I think that all of these all of these pains are persistent, aren't they? But yeah. there are very different um, types of persistent pain. So you get the pain that originates um, what in medical terms we might call nociceptive pain, which originates from tissues, from organs, from joints. But also you get the more neuropathic pains, those that originate from interruption or damage specifically to nerve fibers where because of a lesion in the nervous system the the nerve fibers do not act in the way that you might expect them to um and i think we have to remember that uh, people living with arthritis may have other medical conditions alongside arthritis they may have neuro neurological conditions they may develop other neuropathic or nerve related pain conditions and nerve pain is very different patients with nerve pain will often talk about pain that is very electric very sharp very stabbing um and they may have had they may have underlying neurological conditions, multiple sclerosis. They might have had um, surgery where we know that there's been some nerve damage at some point in the past. And patients need to use all the same principles of self-management, but sometimes I, I suppose the difference might be the different types of medication that sometimes are used. So what can people do to make their lives a bit easier if they're in pain? My first piece of advice, if you're living with persistent pain, is to understand the pain mm -hmm. to try and identify the difference between the short term acute pain which indicates some immediacy some damage or um and requirement to do something critical quickly versus living with a persistent pain condition and really to understand a little bit how that affects you as you said mark pain is a very subjective experience what you experience and what i experience or what anybody else experiences is very personal to them and i think understanding what goes on behind that diagnosis of persistent pain is really important so knowledge is really important and there is lots of resources out there on the internet now which can be helpful to try and help you understand why you're living with the situation that you're living with so i think understanding and knowledge is probably my first thing that i really feel patients would benefit if you're living with persistent pain try and understand it Second to that, I think I think the understanding that if you are living with um, persistent pain um, is that in line with lot many long term conditions, there is there is no one specific cure. No, um, it is about learning uh, a a a mixture or a recipe, if you like, of developing strategies that help you to manage your pain and they nearly always are a recipe rather than a a one-off ingredient mm. um, and recognizing that the interplay between those ingredients is also really important okay. do you have any tips on how people can do this often when you first visit a healthcare professional and explain that you're, you, you've got pain, is that medication comes very high on that list. Mm. It's often the first thing that healthcare professionals offer, particularly in a short, uh, a short interaction with your GP, uh, where there isn't time to explore activity, exercise, the psychological effects of pain, all of those other aspects of managing pain. Medication's often the the, the the thing that is given to patients with persistent pain straight away and medication is at best a good way of helping patients to get started with the rest of the recipe but it's never likely to be the one and only ingredient so that's actually very interesting so a lot of people i have spoken to they when they say they meet with their gp all they want to do is give them pain medication so like 
it's nice perhaps to explain that of the process behind that a bit more is like you said like it's so that that's the starting point just so that they can get going with it could you, could you elaborate a bit more on that for me well i think the, you know the difficulty is that if you work in a pain management service as i do mm. we have 35 minutes 40 minutes with a patient not five or ten minutes which you might have with your gp right um and GPs are um, expert in a mul- multitude of different long uh, of conditions. They need to know all, all there is to know about lots of things. Mm-hmm. Pain specialists, of course, live and breathe helping patients with pain. So I think that's a, a, a very big difference. Definitely. We also know that in the it, when pain is in its acute phase, so that time when you've had an operation, that time when you've broken your ankle, or you've sprained your knee, or you've um, done something very short-term and short-lived, we know that painkillers work quite well. We know that they will ease your recovery. They will aid you getting back. And the tissues, as as the tissues heal, the amount of painkillers you need will uh, decrease. And for for, for many people, you'll stop taking them. So people um, living with persistent pain, people with living living with um, arthritis will often have started with an emergency situation, a hot inflamed knee that's come on. Um, but over time, every time they go back to their GP, the, the risk is that they're given another painkiller or a stronger painkiller or a different type of painkiller. Um, and... But by that time, then I think it's important to think about how painkillers fit in with that, with that sort of management plan. If painkillers allow you to keep overdoing all that exercise you want to do because you want to get the garden fixed or the decorating done, it's a tool to overdo your overdo the activity. And if you overdo the activity, then the risk is that that flares up your pain in its own right. So it's, again, finding that balance to find that balance with activity to boost your ability to do a little bit of activity, keep moving, keep your joints flexing and uh, moving around, gentle walking, gentle exercise, but not so much that you end up in an aspect of overactivity. Mm, definitely if anyone wants any more information about that as well we do have some episodes already in the podcast about planning and pacing and about exercise and activity as well which i think cover a lot of those things quite well but um actually to carry on from what you were just saying there though as like with gps obviously they're very sort of like strapped for time they have there's such a strain on them these days especially how does someone get through to a service like yours so pain management services are um uh, available all around the country their referral criteria will be very different in different areas. Uh, some, for example, in 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 Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, pain services are available um, at the Norfolk and Norwich, and they are by GP referral or healthcare professional um, uh, referral as well. So, if you feel that you know your physiotherapist very well, or you know your um, one of your uh, nurse practitioners very well at your GP surgery, then we would accept referrals from uh, uh, from from anybody there. Some areas of the country will have community based pain management services um, where you're not required to go to one of the bigger uh, acute hospitals to to get your uh, advice around pain management. Now moving on to a bit more sort of about what people, the people side of it. What's the most difficult aspect of people managing pain, do you think? I think the most difficult aspect is the fact that for, for the majority of people living with persistent pain is that it, it doesn't go away. Mm. It's there all the time. Every single day of the week, of the week of the year, year, year upon year. And I think uh, it probably is the psychological effect that living with persistent pain has on people that is very difficult even if they understand the the cause and the the process behind the pain mechanisms even if they understand that pain medications have a role to play but are not the only answer it will be the fact that persistent pain can in some people lead to issues of poor sleep uh poor mental health and uh, sort of the 
stopping people doing the things that are really important to them. Mm. Um, and that's really important as human beings. We we do better when we're doing things that we enjoy, things that are meaningful and valuable to us, whatever that is. Um, and anything that interrupts that starts to have a really big effect on our mood, on our on, on the way we look at life. And um, again, going back to the pain mechanisms, we know that the impact that our 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 feelings has on those pain mechanisms is that things that are positive but equally things that are negative and difficult can all have an effect on the on that volume switch of that way that we understand and experience pain okay so you mentioned sleep there actually and that is something that comes up a lot have you got any tips for people when it comes to sort of being able to sleep whilst being in pain my tips are probably don't google what do I do when I can't sleep? Because I I, I think there are lots of um, less than helpful options out there maybe that um, may not help everybody. I, If it were as easy as this particular type of mattress or that number of pillows or uh, this aromatherapy oil or relaxation technique or whatever, I think it would it would be far more simple. I think to find something that works for you is really important. So some people will find that a hard mattress is helpful. Other people will find that a soft mattress is helpful. Um, but it, it is about finding the things that work for you, trial and error. We do know that um, overactivity and and or underactivity during the day um, will lead to poor sleep patterns at night. So if you are exhausted getting your housework done during the day and you sleep in the afternoon you're more than likely not going to sleep at night um so i think a good routine is important again if people living with a with persistent pain have got into the habit of not having much going on in life therefore they have no routine you know we are we are quite robotic in some some respects i think we're better if we get up at the same time we eat regularly we exercise regularly we do our activities regularly and we go to bed at a similar time is always a better way i think there is an important part to play with using different types of relaxation and so relaxation can be something that's um again is a very personal experience for some people it will be uh aromatherapy oils some people it will be uh relaxation uh and different types of relaxation so music or uh spoken word or mindfulness all sorts of different types of relaxation but again i think re relaxation is a bit of an art yeah <laughs> I, I think too many people will have been sent away by their gp saying google relaxation techniques and again, I think it's practice. It's about finding what works for you. You know, there is no point in if you're somebody that lives lives with persistent pain but has a bladder issue, then running water and sea noise yeah. is, is, <laughs> is never going to help you go to sleep. Um, and 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 addressing busy minds, I think, is the other thing. Thinking about all the um, things that makes people's minds very busy. And trying to address all of that, I think, can be helpful. I remember one of the sort of the best tips I had was, um, the, again, as someone especially with a very busy mind, is if like you can basically psych yourself out, just lying there trying to make yourself sleep. So even just by going off, just, just read a book for 10 minutes, just something that makes your brain think about something completely different. I found always made a big difference. Yeah. Definitely, because again, if you um, reading a book for some people would uh, spark them into what's going to happen on the next page or the That's, page yeah, after yeah. that, <laughs> but but and uh, but for you maybe that that is really helpful. Listening to music does not work for me because mm. when I listen to music, I then start to think of oh, I could I, I'm I need to write a list for this and I'd like to do that and I'd like to do this, and I end up listen to spoken word. And it doesn't really matter what the spoken word is, but that stops me doing that. It's amazing how everyone's just so different. I mean, as, as we say sort of repeatedly, I'm sure everyone's probably bored of me saying this on this podcast, but like what works for one person doesn't work well for another one. Sadly, it's true. I wish I had a, a much cooler way of saying that by now, but that is, that is how it is, isn't it? 
It is absolutely. And I think that is so, so important. And I think going back to, you know, how, why do GPs struggle is that in that in that five or six minutes that they have with you, they're trying to get you to to they're, they're trying to understand you. They may have seen they may have seen four or five patients in that day mm. with persistent pain, but the, you, they'll all be very different. And therefore, they can't be the experts. The only people who are experts are are yourselves. Absolutely. And, and that's really important. Excellent. So where can people who are like in pain or feeling hopeless or helpless from all of this, where can they turn? I think the important thing is it is the internet can be very helpful. Um, I think there are plenty of uh, pain websites you know, arthritis action is a is a useful tool for people to be. Yeah, I was going to say, check out our website. We've got loads of useful stuff on there, including a uh, mental health directory. So if you type in your postcode on there, it can then tell you what services we found that are available for you in, within your area. So that's a really useful one to check out as well. Absolutely. Um, because uh, my... I think the important thing is that very often those websites contain real lived experience um, of people who who are suffering with persistent pain. I think that's really important. The other place, um, and again, this will vary depending on the region um, that you're listening from, but there are uh, local mental health services. So certainly in Norfolk and Suffolk, um, our wellbeing service has a huge number of resources available to people. And if COVID did anything for us, I think what it did do was un- make us understand that we had to have internet based resources out there for people to listen to in their own time in their own space and so i firmly i f- i firmly believe that that is though that those are useful resources so find out from your local um your local local gp services will be able to tell you where your local mental health teams are where your support and help help groups are and use their experience so is there any sort of like last words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with, Catherine, or do you feel you've covered everything so far now? I think my biggest bit of wisdom is understand your pain and understand it's your pain and it's very different. Even if um, all of you out there are suffering with arthritis, um, suffering with persistent pain, but it's very individual to you. Um, don't compare yourself with other people. Find out what works for you. Understand why you're where you are. And remember that you're not alone and that there is lots of help out there um, in a variety of means and forms, languages, all sorts of different means of um, information gathering. And just remember, managing pain is it's a it's a recipe of lots of ingredients put together that will help you to live with pain, but a very much more doing the things you want to do in life and not letting it hold you back. Amazing. Thank you. And so there's more information, as we mentioned, available on our website, which is www.arthritisaction.org.uk. Or if you have a question and you want to ask anything specifically, you can send us an email and send it to podcast at arthritisaction.org.uk. So thank you so much, Catherine. That's been really interesting and I really appreciate your time with us today. That's no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye.